Okay. Well, thanks everybody for coming out tonight or coming back or watching this later on the internet. Um, this is um, our, our second to last cocktail hour chat for the ninth biennial and our second to last week of it being on view at the South Dakota Art Museum. Um, I'm Jody Lunger and the exhibits curator. I don't know if I've introduced myself in every video, so might as well do it for the last couple, right? But um, so this is um, cocktail, cocktail hour chats for the ninth biennial are really a, a replacement for what we usually have, which is an opening reception for the exhibition. Um, you know, we're still in this transition out of the pandemic. So we just decided to forego the reception and instead are talking to 30 out of the 66 artists in the South Dakota governor's ninth biennial art exhibition. Um, so we're thrilled to have nearly half of the artists in the show talking with us over the course of nine weeks during the show. Um, the exhibition is up at the museum right now at the South Dakota Art Museum. It's up through June 13th. Um, so come and check it out there if you haven't had a chance to see it. If you don't get a chance to see it, this show is on tour for a year. Um, so it'll travel from our museum to the Washington Pavilion in Sioux Falls and then to USD galleries um, in Vermilion for about a month in the fall. And then it will move on to the Doll Art Center out at Rapid City before it closes about a year from when it first opened. Um, and that'll be in March of 2022. Um, so we are the opening venue. We've had it on display from March until June 13th here. Um, the show is the ninth biennial, so it's been ongoing since 2003. We take about a year to organize the show and then it travels for a year. Um, and it is an exhibition that's open to all artists currently living and working in South Dakota every time we put out the call. So if you live and work and make art in South Dakota, you're, 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 it's, uh, you're open to um, submit works for the show. And then we jury the show with a panel of representatives from the four institutions it travels to. Um, so four jurors from each of the four institutions, well, from all four institutions get together and they make selections from the works that are submitted. Um, so we're really excited about the show. It's a great show this round. We're excited to do these cocktail hour chats. It's been a great way for us to get a little bit of a, a deeper engagement and hear from so many artists. Um, so every week we've been having three or four artists join us. Um, and I've kind of organized those who are willing to come and play into groups based off of some sort of common thread. Um, so for this week, we have Michael Ramey, Scott Chandler and John Banajic with us. And they're actually, I was just doing the count. They are three out of the 10 artists who have photographs in, in the biennial this year. Um, and they also happen to have a, a common thread in the fact that they're all photographs of like outside. I, I would consider them landscapes, but they're really not like sublime landscapes in a na nature painting tradition. They are um, some sort of exterior scene that shows a human presence in some way, although none of them have figures in them. So I think that the um, that the the intersections between the photographs themselves are really interesting too, um, but all very different. And I'm sure all three of these guys have very different practices. So we're excited to hear um, from each of them about their work. Um, and so what we will do is I will introduce each artist to talk for about 10 to 15 minutes um, and they will share and then we'll move on to the next. And if any of you in the audience have questions or comments, go ahead and throw those into the chat box at any time. Um, and we'll save the questions until the end just so that we don't spend too much time on one artist and don't get a chance to hear from another. Um, so go ahead and throw out chats at any time and then also at the end you'll have a chance to um, bring up any questions for any of the artists you hear from. But I wanna thank the artists for joining us and thank you all for coming again. And with that, um, we'll go ahead and start uh, with Michael Ramey. So thanks for coming. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm really happy to be here and uh, I appreciate you working hard to schedule it around my awkward and difficult schedule too. So <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, so uh, I'm from Rapid City, but I am originally from Detroit. My wife um, grew up in South Dakota. And so we moved here about five years ago. And uh, I have a pretty long history of taking a lot of images of abandoned structures in Detroit. One of the many wonderful things about Detroit is there's a lot of pre-depression architecture in the city. And uh, the city has had its share of hard times. So there's a lot of abandoned buildings. And um, myself and a lot of other people I knew had a deep love and appreciation for these buildings. And so we would run around photographing them in every imaginable way. And um, 
crawling around abandoned buildings was uh, kind of how I spent my free time on the weekend um, because you love these spaces and there was a sense of um, this desire to, to capture them before they were gone and to have some experience with them before they were gone. And many of them were fading fast. And so um, Detroit has gone through a bit of a renaissance and there's a lot of buildings getting saved, which is wonderful to see. But uh, I have a, a long list of buildings that were lost, but um, I spent a lot of time photographing abandoned structures in Detroit. And um, I'm currently working on, uh, it's interesting because after the pandemic hit, I, I started being drawn towards portraits, uh, which was difficult to do. Um, but I, um, I'm currently working on a series of portraits that I'm really excited about. It's, it's fun to do something that's a little bit more of a stretch for myself. Um, so those are two things that I've been working on a lot. And then uh, the third category that I would say I photograph a lot is what's in the show, which I would describe as kind of nocturnal landscapes. I like to take um, a lot of images at night. And, and, and I think that progressed for a lot of reasons. But when you're crawling around abandoned buildings in the city of Detroit, you suddenly go, I wonder what this would look like at night uh, and how the light changes. And so then you end up back there at three in the morning. Um, and your wife thinks you're insane and you're photographing it at three in the morning. And, and you know what, uh, you know what it looks like at night? It looks completely different. That's the answer. And so um, I really uh, started um, to be drawn towards nocturnal landscapes and interested in how they changed, you know, how night changed the feel of the landscape and how it changed uh, in some ways, how, you, you saw the subject matter itself. So, um, and that's what I have in the show and I'll show that image at the very end. Uh, I want to say one more thing before I started in, uh, by training, I'm a psychologist. I'm a clinical psychologist and been practicing for, I, I don't know, long enough. Um, and one of the things that I'm really interested in is how our unconscious mind impacts and influences our perception of art and the creation of art. And so I'm always thinking about intersections between psychology and, and art in general, but photography specifically to me. So um, one of the things I like about um, nocturnal landscapes is, um, is the contrast between, between so much darkness and light. And um, I think a lot about what we're unconscious of, what we can't see, what's dark to us, and what we are conscious of, what, what is lit and illuminated. And so um, that theme is often in the back of my mind as I'm shooting images. I wanted to start with an image. I, I also had this like um, appreciation for um, advertising photography. And I saw this image not too long ago and I'm gonna start to screen share. So if it's not um, working, please let me know. Um, can you guys see this image? Yeah. Okay, so uh, I saw this image and I really fell in love with it. This is from a, this is from an ad for a 1985 Ford LTD Crown Victoria, and what I love about this image and, and this is one of the things that I really love about nocturnal landscapes. Uh, what's so great about this image is it's dripping with suggestion. Okay, so we have very few words in the image. We have the year of the car, we have the make of the car, but you have these people who are getting out of this private jet, and we are assuming they're getting in this. Ford LTD Crown Victoria, which by its very nature is a fairly unremarkable car, but these people are getting out of private jet and they're getting into this car. This car is also out on the runway, which means they had a driver bring it out. That's suggested too by the image. You know, they're not telling us that, but they have a driver. Uh, the drivers put the, uh, the car out there. So when they land, they're ready to go. And uh, this image has all these powerful suggestions for the viewer. Uh, that are beyond the words of it. The most powerful suggestion in this image, though, is that if you buy the Ford LTD Crown Victoria, you might end up with a private jet too. You know, and so that's what I love about this image is how much suggestion is in it. I mean, it knocks you over the the head with suggestion. Uh, so. I'm gonna run through a lot of images in no particular order. And these images are nocturnal landscapes from South Dakota, a lot from Rapid City and uh, from Detroit. And so one of the things I like is the suggestion. Um, when I think about these nocturnal landscapes, the subject matter is really pretty ordinary. There's nothing really remarkable about the subject matter in any of these photographs, but what, um, 
the remarkable part is the content. It's what is being suggested. It's what you might feel. It's how the subject matter might change in the nuance of night. And so that's one of the things that I really like about these images. So um, this is an abandoned uh, apartment complex in Detroit. Like I said, there's lots of abandoned things. And uh, this is the kind of place that we might photograph during the day. But I was always looking for street lamps, you know, because um, street lamps give you this really sharp contrast between something's going to be really well lit and then other things are going to be not so well lit. Um, and Detroit had a long issue with uh, street lamp issues. So you could find a random street lamp just in the middle of nowhere shining for like several years because they didn't run uh, the electrical part but very well. But it made for interesting photographs. Um, one of the other things I like about nocturnal images is it, it gives you this natural way to um, really isolate your subject. So when you have uh, one light source and by and large, things are pretty much dark around it, it becomes easy for that uh, subject matter to become really isolated in a way that can um, feature it that's quite different during the day. This is a pretty busy gas station um, with a lot of activity around it. It doesn't feel or present this way if you went there in the middle of the day. Um, this is a <laughs> this is an image uh, I remember taking. I was actually taking a, a photograph of another building, and I looked behind me, and I saw all these abandoned uh, garbage trucks that they had in a row. And this really powerful light source was helping to kind of silhouette all of these abandoned garbage trucks. And I thought, well, that seems like an interesting photo. Um, this one's here from um, Rapid City. Um, this is part of the. Um, the quarry, the, the uh, concrete um, place uh, over on the other side of town. But I, w one of the things that I, I would pass this all the time, going to school, taking my kids to school. And um, I thought, I really like the structure to the building here. And I thought, I wonder what it's going to look like at night. And so uh, one night I drove over and uh, I thought, well, it looks kind of cool at night and uh, was able to get this image. And you can see some light trails of a few cars going through as I was, uh, as I was taking it. Um, one of the things that I, I loved in running around the city of Detroit at night was Detroit was really interesting because if you were out taking photographs at like um, on a Friday night at like 10, 11, 12, it was very busy. The city's very busy, a lot of activity, people everywhere, cars everywhere, competing light sources everywhere. But like once you got past when the bars closed, if you were out there like at three or four in the morning, the city was completely quiet and um, it was a way of kind of just having it all to yourself. You were there. It was very contemplative. It was a lot of solitude and those spaces would change from spaces where there's a lot of activity and noise and people uh, to transforming into just utter silence in the middle of the night. Um, there was a, um, there was an amusement park that was on a little Island between Detroit and Canada and there were these boats that would take you to that amusement park and the amusement park shut down. But there were a few of these boats that I had heard that were like out there somewhere. And um, I happened to find this boat and it was, it was kind of docked in this river off the Rouge River, just down from the a Ford factory. And, um, and was really excited to find one of the abandoned Bablo boats because there was always these great memories of being a kid and riding this boat over to the amusement park. And then um, it's, not, it's not very often that I had an opportunity to photograph a ghost ship. So that was pretty cool too. So obviously this is a local one here from Rapid. And um, often when I'm shooting at night, um, it's always exciting when you get fog because fog will change the nature of light in ways that are really exciting. And so... Um, Usually the worse the weather, the better the photographs. And so um, it, if it's really, really cold it, in South Dakota, it often gets foggy here in the Black Hills before it starts to snow. So you might get a couple of hours of, uh, of fog for winter. This was taken in the winter. I could see a little bit of snow on the ground, but fog always is exciting to shoot in because it, um, it changes the way you experience the light, diffuses the light. Um, and then occasionally, you know, I would be photographing abandoned structures and things at night as well. This is like a little uh, 
candy shop that had become abandoned uh, that I happened upon one day. And I thought, well, that looks like it would be kind of cool at night. Um, just in a neighborhood where I'm sure kids used to run around and buy candy there. And this is in a neighborhood in Detroit, kind of at uh, twilight. Uh, this is of a of an abandoned factory, one of the, my favorite places to kind of run around and explore. And uh, this evening, it kind of snowed a little bit. You can, you can see there's kind of some precipitation in that light. It's like kind of snowy, foggy, but made for some nice contrast in the light. Uh, uh, lots of interesting murals in the city. And uh, this one I thought just was lit well and interesting to photograph. Lots of little churches in the city of Detroit too. You could kind of do a whole series on just photographing these little tiny churches in the middle of nowhere. Um, and uh, again, uh, it's the kind of thing where you don't quite know what it's going to look like at night until you drive around and see it. Uh, so this building is, um, where, uh, they eventually Henry Ford moved the major part of manufacturing for the model T to, it's a huge, massive building. And you can see it literally goes on like about three blocks there. And, um, I had thought, I wonder what, what it would look like at night. And, uh, a friend and I were kind of on the street there scoping it out one night and, and got this image that I thought was kind of nice, but, um, just um, because I had such an appreciation for architecture in the city, a lot of the things that I would photograph in the landscapes were, were building related. Uh, this is another uh, abandoned factory in the city of Detroit and uh, kind of a little cityscape, which I didn't do very often, but here's one. Uh, one of the things about the residential communities in Detroit is you would find um, a house and um, a, like abandoned lots beside of it because uh, the population had left the city. And so, which that could make some interesting photographs too, where you end up having this juxtaposition between a family living in the space and, and a lot of emptiness around them. Um, and you would see that often in the city. This is another I think this is the Model T plant that I was just referencing to. And then um, this is an oil refinery, which I had driven by for many, many years. And um, oil refineries are lit up really well for a lot of safety reasons. Um, but um, one night had just parked a car and ended up walking around quite a bit thinking there's some really interesting lighting going on here. And um, the, uh, what I didn't realize is the oil refineries are part of... Uh, uh, necessary infrastructure. And so we got ran out by some federal agents who thankfully didn't arrest us. Uh, but I assured them I was going back to my car and leaving and he believed me and that's what I did. Um, but I at least got the photograph before I left, you know, so, uh, I've been chased out of many places and, and I'd often ask, well, can I just finish the photograph before I leave? And, and, uh, nine out of 10 times people say, sure. You know, so I'm pretty friendly about it. So, um, I like this image because, um, again, it kind of ties into some interest that I have in, in advertising. Like I, I like advertising messages that are really blunt, like kill bugs, you do it. You know, there's no, there's no ambiguity in that messaging, you know, for, for a company. So, and um, this is just an overpass in the city. I'm, I'm not sure whether this place was abandoned or whether they still sold work clothes or not, but it had some cool signs out front. Um, and so this is my last photo. This is the piece that I had in, uh, the biannual. And, uh, whenever you submit pictures for a show, you never know what's going to be chosen. And if I select three pictures, they always choose my least favorite of the three. I don't know why that is. Perhaps I have terrible taste. No one's willing to tell me that. Uh, so, uh, but what I was excited about this show is they, they picked my favorite out of the three. And I, I don't know that's ever, ever happened before. And so this is the Bell Inn in Belle Fouche. And they had this really amazing sign that I wanted to photograph, but the sign was so unpredictable. It was broken. It didn't work. It'd be off. I'd call the restaurant and I'd say, is your sign on tonight? And the waitress thought I was insane. Um, and 
And she was nice enough to say yes or no. I tried to photograph. I wanted to photograph it at twilight. That never worked out. I finally got to photograph it at night. I tried many times to photograph the Bell Inn, but the sign just would not cooperate. Finally, the stars aligned. And one night, uh, they said the sign was on. I drove by and I got this image. And little did I know that they were going to sell the building and it would be torn down. And so I was really grateful that I got the image because it ended up uh, transitioning into my other category, which is abandoned empty spaces. So, uh, but I was happy to get it while it was there. And I worked really hard to get this sign on at night one night. And I really was happy with the image. And uh, they, they parked semis in this lot. And right as I finished, the semi pulled like literally a foot in front of me and parked. And the, and, and the guy got out of the semi and he said, I didn't see you there. My tripod was set up and I was taking this image and he goes, I didn't see you there. And I said, he says, you want me to move? I said, no, I think I've got it. And I was able to leave with that and, and was happy to get it before um, they tore it down. So. That's the end of my slides. That's the end of my talk. Thank you, Michael. I love, I love that story on that piece. That's such a good backstory on that one. And I'm glad we picked your favorite this time. I love Thank that it that it's this transitional piece between these two st streams of work. That's really cool, cool to hear about. So cool. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay. Well, I think we um, need to stop screen share. There we go. And then I think we're ready to go ahead and pass it off to Scott. Welcome. Thank you. How you doing? Sorry, if I drink a lot, I'm currently in Southern Utah and it's 102 <laughs> degrees and drier than I've had for a few years. So a little parched. All right, do you just want me to go ahead or? Yeah, go for it. All right. So I am going to share my whole entire desktop because I am ill prepared and didn't want to put together a PowerPoint because I didn't have all my stuff because I'm on the road. So. Um, <laughs> So I guess I'll start by when you say landscape photography, there's something in me that like cringes. Because when I started photography, I grew up in Southern Utah, very close to Zion National Park, Bryce Canyon, Cedar Breaks. And I hated landscapes. I didn't wanna see another photo of red rocks and blue sky in my whole entire life. It made me want to throw my camera off a cliff. And so, uh, when I was in undergrad, I started photographing. I came from painting and I don't know how I ended up in photography. I think it's because I hated it and I thought it was easy. And then I found something that I absolutely loved about it. And here I am teaching it. Um, but what ended up happening is this project started in a class and then carried over into my, my first real professional project. And so what happened is I was taking a landscape photography class and I refused to take a picture of a landscape. So what I started doing was sculpting my bed into modernist landscapes and lighting it and photographing it. So this first one is the Pacific Ocean. This is Hillary Step of Mount Everest. That is uh, the north rim of the Grand Canyon. So to me, these became more sculptural than anything, Mount Fuji. And this all kind of started from an old childhood memory of waking up and the sheets kind of being like a landscape. And then when I was a kid, I'd play with my action figures on them. And so I just kept kind of making these. And so I started introducing like fog, but I wanted to do just obscure landscapes at first, but I found out they weren't that good. So what I did is I'd go to Google and I would search chimney rock, for example, and I would kind of look at the whole page and say, okay, which is the most iconic view of chimney rock? And then I would make a quick line drawing because if I was looking at the photos, I would obsess over the details. And so I wanted a suggestion because I, I was literally sculpting with, my rule was if it's in your room, you can use it. And so it's like jeans, pillows, like anything from the bed or the book I was reading. And so I'd make this quick line drawing and I would just start sculpting based off my line drawing. And this is a uh, Zion Canyon from Angel's Landing, some rolling hills, uh, crater rock in Hawaii. So I started kind of obsessing over these cliffs of moor and I felt good because I wasn't a landscape photographer and I was doing something. I was kind of 
criticizing at Ansel Adams. So shooting these as black and white, large format, you know, just to, to make some sort of commentary on, I'm not a photographer, I'm an artist, and I liked having my control still. So th that ended up, which is the Grand Tetons, being something that I, I still explore these to this day. There's times when, you know, I find myself going somewhere. I made this one in response to Ansel Adams. That's my version of Half Dome. That's the Ansel Adams Sand Dune. Ayers Rock, this was the first one I ever made. That's the frozen tundra. And then we got the, the Atlantic Ocean. I, I made that one after a Hiroshi Sujimoto for a photo, if anyone knows that photographer. So that was my like rebelling against landscape because being from Southern Utah, I was like, no, 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 no landscapes, none of that. I am an, a real artist. And so um, from there, I find myself being way more of a landscape photographer than I actually wanted to be. But what happened is, I, I like to construct my scenes. I, I don't, I'm not a, a purist of any way, shape or form. I'm the person who will walk into a scene and move it if it doesn't look right. I will manipulate it heavily in the camera. I will manipulate it heavy, heavily in post-production because I, you know, I don't know why. I just, I feel the need to get the image that's in my head onto the page and I don't care what it takes to get there sometimes. So um, I'll move on to a, another series I did. And this actually happened after a really weird time kind of in my life where I was working as a video producer for photography classes and teaching adjunct in Denver. And then one day they cut two thirds of the production team. And so I had a week to move, had the move back to Southern Utah and in with family. And I needed to get away. I hadn't made any artwork. I had been busy for so long. And so my wife and I rented this house in the middle of Oregon. And the title for the Airbnb was Forest Seclusion. And so the series ended up being named Forest Seclusion. So I started photographing around the house, trying to think about uh, a narrative. And what I found happening is I grew up in the Southwest. When I walk outside, I can, from where I'm sitting now, I can see Nevada. And you can see for hundreds of miles, but when I was in the trees, I noticed it was very closed in and very claustrophobic. And I started to find that I found the interiors to be warm and inviting. And I was just, the, the woods were foreign to me. So what I did is as I colored this, I kind of did an opposite thing that most people would do. I tried to over accentuate my warms. So if it was a natural man-made light, I made it really warm, almost like a fire and comforting. And when it was ambient light in the sky, in the woods, I tried to make it cold and a little bit artificial. And so all of these have this juxtaposition of kind of the warm and cool mixing. And I liked kind of playing off of the house as like a beacon of safety. And so you'll notice as I get further into the images, there's always the cool outside and the warm inside lights. And I was trying to tell like these little micro narratives of, a suggestion of people. So there's like the two deer, the two seats, the two unlit candles, and then a plate at the table, knowing that this place is lived in, there's something happening. But I always wanted there to be this presence of the other, and the other to me was the, the, the forest. And so as the series progresses, and I progressed in the space, I started getting further and further away. This was one of my favorite images. I don't know how well it, it reads on uncalibrated screen, but just these spots of sunlight that would come through the woods that were almost like a religious object and made whatever it was lighting feel important. And so you can see that it started very warm and very in the house and now it's getting very cold and very far away from the house. And I, as I get further and further, I did do some light painting because I don't, that was a big chunk of like burned something and I just loved the way it looks, so I light painted it to make it feel like it had a presence, that other that I'm talking about. And just making the natural light feel as artificial as possible. And then I ended up ending the series with this photo that I call Nest, which just kind of felt like a home away from home. And it was just in this artificial light, but mildly inviting and kind of 
scary at the same time. So kind of a little interesting series. I, I look at my work not as single images, but as uh, an entire narrative. And so I kind of sequence um, in that way. So, um, and I think the last one I'll go over and then I'll get into the one from the show is kind of currently what I'm doing right now. So I used to travel a lot. I went to school in Savannah, Georgia and my family was all in Southern Utah. And so I would travel cross country and I'm a very, we have point A, we have point B, and in between there is fuel, gas, and food, and those all happen on the same stop. So as I was driving across Kansas, uh, I was on my second day of a three-day drive. I was a little bit loopy. I'd been in the car for way too many hours, and I saw a sign that said, world's largest prairie dog. And so in my sleep-deprived mind, I thought, oh, that must be some morbidly obese, very depressed prairie dog with like children poking it with sticks in some like random farm out in the boonies, you know, who knows where. And so I had this very dystopian view of this scenario and I kept seeing all these roadside attractions and I would, God forbid, I pull over and look at it because I was trying to get to point B. And so I started constructing them in my mind and I still want to do a series where I just kind of construct what I what I thought they were and take a picture. But so since moving to South Dakota and we're very rural in Spearfish where I teach at BH, I travel around a lot and I started noticing these really kitschy, campy roadside things. And I'm like, you know what? Let's go see them and let's photograph them. Because every photo I see is some cell phone photo. And I come from a very formalist background where you frame it up, you keystone it in camera, you you don't crop, you don't do all of these things. And so I, I decided to just project my formalist aesthetic and try to make these as quirky looking as, as godly possible. And then I also try to make the colors kind of this light storybook kind of feel because they feel very fantasy to me. And so I started around South Dakota, just kind of finding these oddities. So I call this roadside attractions and oddities. And I just started, you know, photograph and all the weird things of why do we have a corn palace? Why is it just a basketball court? I don't know, but it looks great. Why do we have a huge chair? I don't know, but Deadwood's weird. And so I started in South Dakota and every time I travel, when I find just one of these things that piques my interest and it hits that level of absurdity and kitschiness, I just bust out my camera and I try to find the most obscure way or weird way to to photograph it so it's the largest candy land looks like a weird vinyl sided building to me but i love these things like the big guns teddy bear town president's park that got closed dino hill we got a lot center of the nation and then i found out there's a piece of the berlin wall in rapid city and i'm like i am making a drive tonight so when I find these, these absurd things, I kind of pull over and, and photograph them now because I never stopped. And I'm on a road trip right now. And here I got a little, if you follow me on Instagram, I'm posting some of them right now, but uh, these are my current ones that I've just made on my trip in, uh, in Southern Utah. So those are both fake rocks in the middle of a roundabout to go with that sculpture all the rocks in Utah, and they sculpt some rocks to look real. Um, this is my hometown of Cedar City, Utah, and this is the highest elevation landlocked lighthouse in the world. It's at about 6,000 feet, not a drop of water to be found, and never thought it was that weird growing up, but I drove back there the other night. I made this photo last night, so I stayed at Little America, and I thought that was a great photo, but then I found this guy the emperor penguin that died on its, on its voyage over from Antarctica in 1950 and they taxidermied it and threw it in the lobby. And there is nothing better to me than, than something like that. The stories, the, the absurdity, got the water tanks at Little America. And then I found this awesome spider made out of license plates at some pest control company. So literally right on the side of the road. So with these, I try to show the road in some ways or the area that they're in, because I feel like there's such weird, kitschy, absurd places that some people don't see, some people don't take the time to look at. So I try to make them as 
aesthetically pleasing as possible, though they can be kind of some mundane places. And uh, I'll talk about this one real quick. Do I have some more? Am I good on time? I'm trying to hurry. Um, so this one, I actually, it's funny, this isn't on my website. This isn't, um, this isn't one that, I, I, I love the photo, but it just doesn't have a place yet in a series. I have this kind of ongoing series I call fictions, but this doesn't have a narrative and I look for narrative with uh, images. And this one has a narrative, but it just doesn't fit with my other narratives. And so what, what happened is when I go to places, I've told you I hate photographing landscapes. I took a group of students to Iceland. I almost wanted to leave my camera on the plane because Iceland has been so photographed so many times that what I decided to do is I said, you cannot photograph the main attraction. That was the limit I gave myself. I'm like, you need to find the most unique image you can that's not the thing that everyone's pointing their camera at. And so these are actually the water closets, aka the bathrooms at Glacier Lagoon. So behind me is Glacier Lagoon and all its spectacular glory. And I was looking at the students and all of a sudden I just saw the tips of them almost like the glaciers. And I loved how they had colored the glaciers to match the landscape. I got another series where I'm obsessed with how homes can blend into landscapes and kind of that, uh, the way we, we build to be unobtrusive, but yet it's weirdly obtrusive. Um, and so I turned around and I just saw these four peaks and there were people walking by and the people looked like Godzilla walking over it because it was, it's kind of a, a play on perspective. And, and I'm weird, I don't carry a lot of lenses around. So I think this was a fixed 35 millimeter lens and I had to find almost the hyperfocal distance to keep those in focus in the foreground because I just wanted it flat. I didn't want there to be any depth. I wanted to bring those right up on the viewer and try to make it feel like this weirdly surreal version of, of Glacier Lagoon. So whenever I go to, on trips and I'm in a very highly photographed location, I kind of look for the same thing I look for with my roadsides. I look for these oddities or these unique compositions that you know, so many people are fixated on the main attraction that they don't look around. And I don't care about the main attraction. I hate beautiful photographs. I like weird, ugly photographs. So I try to find these absurd little interactions of, of the land and man-made things or other things that, that just kind of pique my interest in are visually compelling because I, I really like to design my frames. And if you look at any of my work, like I'm such a formalist, it hurts. I had a German, uh, I had a German professor for undergrad who made me print the border. And so I still still feel the need to compose well in camera and, and print my borders. So but yeah, that's that's what I got. And if anyone wants to see anything else, my Instagram has some stuff, a lot of cat pictures, and uh, and then my website has a bunch of other kind of if you like weird stuff like I do, check out my website. <laughs> Thank you, Scott. You know, I was going to say that the sentiment with the piece that's in the biennial reminds me of someone that John Banajic taught me about back in art school named William Ouija. And mm -hmm. he would take the photographs of, you know, so for those of you who don't know his work, there would be like a horrific kind of crime scene and everybody's shooting that. And he would turn around and take shots of the people in the crowd or the people viewing it. So it's a total subversion of what the main attraction is in a really similar way. Yeah. Yeah, and, and when I, I can go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, and when I title them, I specifically put like Glacial Lagoon. So somebody's like, why didn't he photograph Where's Glacial that? Lagoon? <laughs> right. Yeah, but I could tell it's a really formalist. I can tell your form formalist zeal from it. I think that was a big appeal for us, was the really the form in that piece for sure. Okay. You know, I'll throw out a one quick question before we go to John because it popped up in the chat and our new director Donna is wondering if you could just share with people a little bit what light painting is because a lot of folks who don't use photographic digital manipulation might not know. But. Um, what light painting is, is it's adding light into the scene. So photography is, we view things fluidly as they move and a, a photograph is an accumulation of light. And so you can leave your camera open for 20 minutes and you still see one single picture. So what um, a light painting is, 
is you'll leave your camera open and you'll add light to where it would be dark. So you take a flashlight and you paint it on your subject. And then when you close the camera, you get the result of the accumulation of that light on the sensor. All right, thank you. Okay, well, let's go ahead and we will um, pass it to John. If you've had any other questions for any of the artists or for John, feel free to put them in the chat anytime. And then when he is finished, we will have a little bit more time for that. So thank you and on to John Benagrick. Oh, there, can you hear me? There you go. Oh, great. Why, well, I uh, have to say I got a taste for wall drug donuts looking at some of those roadside attraction <laughs> things. Uh, really kind of nice. And that last one, <clears throat> too, I, I thought, uh, you know, with all the images uh, being put up uh, in public these days of uh, the Mars rover, you know, and uh, the Chinese have one going and you get all these uh, shots uh, coming back from Mars. Uh, there's kind of a similar quality. It's so primal, you know, that uh, uh, one of, uh, you know, with the uh, water closets up on this uh, rubble. Uh, but uh, that might be an interesting series to work on is actually uh, uh, take photos of some uh, uh, odd little forgotten corners of the earth uh, and make it seem like uh, you're discovering a new planet, uh, you know, as if you kind of came down and uh, discovered uh, uh, the earth and uh, uh, collected what you think is important to know about. Uh, just within the land, but uh, anyhow, yeah, I, I really like those, uh, all those, uh, 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 the, the, I'm, <laughs> I'm getting in everybody else's work, but uh, the other stuff too, you know, the night stuff, I love going out and photographing at night, uh, but the stuff that uh, uh, Michael was doing uh, is really psychological. I, I kind of liked how those, uh, especially the black and white uh, images, uh, seem to come out of nothingness as if uh, there was some memory materializing like you know when you think of um, say uh, the house that you grew up in you don't remember all the little detail outside of it you just remember certain things that illuminate within your own memory and uh, uh, that's the feeling I got is uh, uh, with a lot of them it was some thought coming to mind or maybe some memory disintegrating you know, especially with those images taken in Detroit, where th buildings actually are disintegrating, uh, uh, it almost seems like uh, uh, the way the detail seems to uh, go out into the deep darkness from the light source, it seems like uh, the way maybe a memory would disintegrate in somebody's mind. You know, really kind of nice. You know, so uh, yeah, I really appreciate all of <laughs> Well, and I was going to say, John, in terms of um, night images, you know, we, I don't know if you know, we acquired some of your photo photography that was in Joe and Signe Stewart's collection. So those night scenes of Chicago. Yeah, we could, I could see the connection there in your own work. Oh, sure. yeah. Well, I, I continue to add to that. I, you know, I, uh, I started doing that back in <laughs> the 1970s or so, you know, the south side of Chicago and, uh, I appreciated uh, uh, being young and being able to walk around uh, the inner city without much trouble. Uh, and there were some war zones uh, you know, in Chicago during those days. And uh, I used equipment that was so big, uh, you know, sometimes an eight by 10, a lot of times four by five shooting film. And, uh, you know, I could easily walk around and nobody would bother me because nobody wanted to steal that photo equipment because they didn't want to lug it around you know so uh in fact they even told me that I remember sitting on some bus with you know tripod and all this stuff my sheets of film you know and these things and they just looked at me and said you know we'd love to steal that stuff but man it'd be hard to lug it around so it just me. <laughs> but uh but no the stuff that I uh entered in into the governor's uh, show was just stuff that I was working on and uh, it was uh, uh, actually work that I took uh, in 1986 and 87 when I took a trip to China. And uh, I uh, thought, uh, I always had it in mind that I'd love to go to China because uh, it's on the other side of the world. You know, when I was a kid, people said, oh yeah, if you 
Well, actually, I, I have a memory. Uh, me and my friend Toothless Timas and Dickie Wilson, we were digging some underground fort, you know, some abandoned lot. And uh, we were digging this hole, digging it, you know, deep enough so we could cover it with cardboard. And then go in there and read comic books all summer, you know. And as we were digging it, uh, old man Petticourt uh, lived a few doors down, uh, looked at us kids, you know, he was laughing. He said, you know, if you guys keep digging, you're going to dig all the way to China. And I thought, what? That's exactly what we're going to do. So we were digging, trying to get down to China, you know, <laughs> of course, never reached it. But I always had it in mind, man, if I was going to go to some exotic place, well, China's the furthest away. You could go, so I wanted to go and see why it's on the other side of the, the world. Of course, you know, Canton, South Dakota, a lot of people don't realize it's named Canton, South Dakota, because they figured Canton was on completely the other side of the earth. And they named it that, or T maybe has some connection too, but that's why they named it Canton. Uh, so anyhow, you know, when I got my first sabbatical, I went out there and, uh, with no agenda or anything. In fact, my biggest plan was just to go out there and get lost, you know, to find places where I didn't know where in the hell I was and see if I could make it back. And I spent six months just bouncing around there. Uh, and it was at a time when uh, China was just uh, changing. Uh, although when I was there, it still didn't change much. It was right before Tiananmen Square. And so uh, I did a lot of uh, photos, he had a couple shows, you know, with a lot of the black and white journalistic kind of images that I uh, did, but I always had this set of slides that I never did anything with. And uh, I thought, well, I'll get to that. And I can't tell you how many projects that I have that are like that. In fact, this summer, I'm planning to uh, print up a series of photos that I took in 1970. 71 and 72 when I was a night watchman at the Art Institute of Chicago uh, while I was going to school there. I took all these photos, there must be 200 in the series, you know, that I like. I just never got around to printing them, you know, so I thought maybe this summer I might do that. Uh, but uh, last summer, you know, I pulled those slides out and printed, uh, oh, probably about uh, 150 or so on lithofilm and thought, well, maybe I'll print them with, uh, uh, Van Dyke Brown, uh, maybe Palladium, uh, give them some uh, quality of age to it because going through China, it's like walking through time, you know, back in those days and maybe you still get some of it now, although I haven't been back in a long time, but uh, I'd go to, to places in China where I don't think it's changed, uh, you know, for maybe 500 years uh, in some parts, you know, and so I, I thought maybe some older quality of uh, image maybe collodion or something. And uh, I always had it in the back of my mind that uh, you could show some of those images, Carolyn, uh, if uh, you have some, but uh, you know, if, a, if there's a split image or something, but uh, I think there's uh, about 150 in that series, maybe. Uh, and this is one of them. And uh, uh, it, uh, uh, it kind of materialized in my mind years ago that I wanted to make use of thousands and thousands of uh, uh, boxes of photographic paper that I'd pick up for free. You know, people were throwing it out or whatever. It was a good quality paper, but uh, with outdated paper, you can't get any highlights. You know, it's all just kind of flat. And uh, there wasn't really anything I could do with the paper aside from maybe printing on the back, which I, uh, when I'd uh, teach palladium printing, a lot of times I'd take old sheets of uh, outdated paper and just print on the backside of the paper, uh, you know, being a cotton fiber paper, I mean, really archival paper, but I always had it in mind to uh, take that paper and run it through a fixer and get rid of all the silver in it. So it's just gelatin on a good quality paper. And uh, I soaked it in uh, salt water, uh, salt water solution. Uh, so the sodium chloride would kind of saturate uh, and I'd, I'd leave it in for a couple hours, you know, it didn't matter uh, that much, but uh, I'd squeegee it off and let it dry. And then I would take uh, silver nitrate. And if you combine silver nitrate with chloride, you get a silver chloride uh, light sensitive emulsion. And so, you know, I wasn't sure what was going to happen, you know, but I, I took it and coated it with silver nitrate. I think it was a 13% solution. 
and uh, let it dry up. And then I took my negatives uh, uh, that were going to be contact printed uh, on that material. And I uh, put it in a contact printing frame and just took it outside and exposed it for about 10 minutes, I think it was, and uh, brought it in, lifted up the negative, And it's almost like a printing out paper. You can see a beautiful image there already. Uh, a little bit more reddish brown than this, but uh, then you take that uh, 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 image and you run it through water, a little water bath with a little bit of salt water in there. Uh, and uh, the image kind of changes a little bit in color and I rinse it in water and I put it in a sodium thiosulfate fixer and uh, it turns it more of a chocolate brown. But then an odd thing happened that I, I didn't predict was uh, in the deepest parts of black, it's more of a rusty brown. And in the highlight areas, it's more of a, a greenish, bluish kind of cooler tone. And I really like that effect. And so uh, uh, basically, uh, that's the, uh, the process. Uh, I would take, uh, after fixing, I'd put it through some uh, citric acid as kind of a final uh, uh, clearing bath. And then I'd wash it up for about uh, 40 minutes and dry them up. And they would change as they would dry it, too. Uh, but I really thought it added some three-dimensional quality to it. Plus, it kind of, you know, with the uh, strokes of uh, uh, emulsion that I'd apply with a brush, uh, it seemed to magically have this image appear. And there was kind of a mysticism, you know, walking through China. Uh, things would appear... Uh, as I would wander around, I wasn't looking for anything in particular, some cultural things. You know, I like to take pictures of people. Uh, none of them appear in uh, these, not many anyhow, but uh, uh, there are some. Uh, but in that one series that I printed, it's more journalistic. Uh, there were a lot more people in that. But, uh, but anyhow, this one, I remember uh, I was in Beijing. I spent about a month in Beijing wandering around getting lost, you know, bumping into different things. I mean, there's tons of stories, but uh, we sure don't have time to get into any of those. But I uh, was walking through this park and this one older Chinese guy uh, was getting the park ready for winter because uh, I think I was out there, oh man, from October to January, something like that in uh, China. And uh, uh, anyhow, uh, as he was doing it, you know, wrapping these... Uh, uh, rosebush uh, plants with this burlap, uh, it kind of looked like uh, a group of samurai, uh, you know, some uh, figurative uh, 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 group, you know, that uh, uh, kind of had its own energy explode, you know, from different levels. And I, I kind of really like that. And so I, I just took it, uh, you know, as simply as I, I could. And uh, uh, it looks like a a group of uh, samurai or maybe some uh, cultural uh, uh, body movement dancers doing something, you know, in the park. Uh, but uh, some of the others, uh, you know, they, they might focus in on some of the architecture. Uh, and Carolyn, you can just, yeah, flip through some. I mean, this one, uh, it's a mural painted on a building, uh, probably in Shanghai, I think this was. Uh, and it has a landscape within it. Uh, that uh, is almost like a, a portal into some other time, you know, mm -hmm. and on the outside, you, you see something a little bit more contemporary. There's kind of a, a contemporary building back there, you know, and uh, as I wandered around uh, Beijing, uh, Shanghai, just as they started building these high-rise buildings, uh, I noticed a lot of times, and this is 86, 87, uh, uh, work would stop on some of those buildings and, you know, I'd try and talk with some of the people. I was able to learn a little Chinese before I left naturally after six months, you know, uh, uh, trying to talk uh, with some of the people. But I found out that a lot of the buildings, uh, they stopped construction on the building because they knew what the buildings were supposed to look like, but they didn't know how to pump water up to the top floor. <laughs> so the technology just wasn't there. You know, uh, so it was really kind of an odd time between real primitive, primal uh, China and some new technological thing that was right on the shoreline of being developed. Uh, so anyhow, yeah, this is like a little fragment. This is the uh, Forbidden City. You know, as I was wandering around there, uh, there were uh, pockets of uh, places in the 
inner city of Beijing that you could barely move. I mean, it was elbow to elbow. You know, uh, uh, luckily for me, I'm uh, taller than most Chinese people. So, I, you know, I'd be able to see where I was going <laughs> at least. But it was just dense with people. But uh, there were certain times, certain places where it would be completely empty and haunted. You know, so this is like, um, you know, right in the Forbidden City, early in the morning, not many people there. Uh, winter was just starting to come. And uh, again, you know, I kind of like the color of it uh, by that effect. And I really don't know anybody doing that process. Uh, there's still so much room for invention with photography, some of those older processes. I mean, we're inventing stuff every day. <laughs> I mean, we'll do something, you know, that's different. I, I really can't get through all the processes that uh, I know about uh, uh, before the uh, school year ends. I mean, it's just endless. And uh, I do that, you know, along with digital, you know, and a lot of times there'll be a blend of uh, digital capture with some older process. Uh, uh, the mixing of different material uh, just opens things up. And for, you know, photographers in the art department where you're trying to invent your own language uh, really comes in handy. You know, you see a certain effect, uh, you feel that it's maybe the language that you need to use to tell the story of the, the subject matter that you're working with. And people will just go off and uh, really invent some language for themselves. Uh, it's really kind of nice to watch. It's one of the reasons why it's really hard to leave you know, and retire uh, doing something like this because uh, the adventures, the visual adventures that take place day after day, I mean, it's just so much fun. You know, uh, I don't know if I could ever leave. I don't know. But anyhow, so, you know, I was trying to invent a language for this. Suzhou uh, that has, I think, three times as many canals as Venice. Uh, it's just a beautiful uh, uh, subliminal kind of place uh, to walk around. I remember uh, getting lost in that city. I, I think I spent uh, Chinese New Year's there and uh, wandered into some distant park from where I was staying uh, for some big celebration that commemorated some poem that was written in the 400s, uh, you know, centuries and centuries ago. And they still commemorate uh, the poet and uh, they have the ceremony and everything. And I, I didn't even know what was happening. I just wandered in. And, uh, you know, of course, you know, some Westerner, when they find out some, we well, back then, anyhow, when they found some Westerner that seemed to be uh, out for some adventure, they purposely would focus in on you to see how drunk they could get you to be. <laughs> and, and oh man, it was uh, it was a memorable evening trying to wander through Suzhou, finding my way home. Uh, this is the uh, Summer Palace up north of Beijing. Uh, again, you know, just wandering around. I mean, I I really am kind of a bum. You know, when I, I go out to some place, I uh, bump into people, uh, uh, have little adventures. Uh, I mean, there's too many to even talk about. Uh, but, you know, for instance, I'd be walking down some street in Shanghai and I'd pass some place where there were a bunch of people dancing and they were trying to learn how to dance waltzes uh, while listening to Western uh, waltz music. Again, 1986, 87. And, you know, I kind of stuck my head and they saw that I was a Western. They drug me in there. You know, they said, how do you do this? How do you do that? You know, and I love dancing the polka. Of course, I'm Polish, grew up on the south side of Chicago. And so they turned the polka on. It's kind of a German umpa band, you know. And, uh, you know, I, I saw that uh, uh, they weren't that familiar with uh, doing the polka. But, man, I spun around the dance floor a couple of times with a few people. Man, it was a lot of fun. You know, I did that for a couple hours, you know, talked with them a little bit. And then I was back on the road, just wandering through neighborhoods in Beijing. You know, uh, this is uh, looking north uh, from the Great Wall, a little outpost in Siberia uh, somewhere. Uh, but uh, uh, I took uh, some boat from, uh, God, where was it? Uh, from... Uh, uh, Hangzhou into uh, Beijing. And uh, I just kind of stumbled upon this place. I, you know, I carried everything on my back and stumbled into this uh, 
place that seemed to say that uh, they had boats going to Beijing or was it, uh, God, I forget where in the hell I was going, but you know, I got on and it was something like a three day trip. And uh, they put me in a little cabin with a family of Chinese people, you know, and a couple kids, you know, we had a great time. Uh, but uh, yeah, you know, so, you know, most of these, how am I doing on time? Uh, am, I, am I doing okay? We're time? probably good to wrap up soon. Yeah, yeah, yeah we, uh... just wrap it up because <laughs> I, I mean, I could go on and on, but uh, yeah. Oh, they, that's a great shot. Yeah. Yeah. So anyhow, yeah, there's about well, 150 was... in that series, but. Anyhow, yeah, let, uh, open it up for questions or something. Yeah, let's do that. And I do, I love the fact that you, you know, I don't think I realized with this piece in the show that you're revisiting a series from, what, 25, oh, yeah. 30 oh, plus yeah. years ago. Right, <laughs> right, right. I do that every once in a while, pull something out. But you know, I don't think art has an expiration date. No. Uh, yeah. And uh, that stuff I never printed before, you know, so it's right. new to me. <laughs> yeah well and the kind of darkroom inventiveness of how to that process too which is something we haven't really talked about a lot with the three of you but the different kinds of darkroom processes and how much you're digital or not you know and I don't know Michael your process with photography and printing if you're what kind of equipment you're using some of that gets so technical I don't know a lot of folks will understand a lot about it but um, it, it is fascinating, you know, when you think photograph and how everybody can shoot them now, how many different processes there are, how much you can manipulate. I think that's the stuff people know a little bit less about. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, there's uh, one thing that I was thinking of uh, just the other day when uh, somebody was, uh, Dylan uh, Bryant, he's also in the show, uh, mm -hmm. he's doing some cyanotypes here before he goes to the Art Institute of Chicago for grad school. And, uh, you know, we're just kind of thinking of things. We have an old printer uh, that takes inks, you know, so it's actually liquid ink. And uh, we were thinking, you know, we, we should just dump all those inks out and fill all those things up with cyanotype emulsion oh. and scan something, you know, on a scanner uh, and then just print it, you know, so the cyanotype emulsion, you know, which is light sensitive will make the image then just take that print out and throw it out in ultraviolet light and run it underwater and shoot it with uh, hydrogen peroxide. And you'd have this, you know, kind of a blend of digital and uh, some old process invented yeah. in the 1800s, you know, and then of course you could draw and paint into it or layer uh, gum dichromates on top if you felt a need to, uh, yeah. you know, so many life experiences are layered. Well, there's a number of different layered processes it could be a visual equivalent, you know, of something like that, yeah. you know, but it's all magic. It's all fun. You know, I'll bring grade mm -hmm. school kids in sometimes and we'll do stuff like that. And they just, they're, they're shocked to know that you could just take some tin that you could pick up at the second hand store and poke a hole in it, load it up with some light sensitive material that you maybe mix up yourself and make yeah. an exposure outside and actually have a photo without even using any electricity. Yeah. I mean, it's all primal caveman photo. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Yeah, they really like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was so good to hear that. I think that was really fun to hear yeah. and the kinds of different processes and, oh. and realize that there's so much of that out there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, every yeah. day you could think of some new thing. Right. Uh, yeah, we were printing on plants the other day, uh, too, and... Uh, you know, a lot of people don't realize uh, photosynthesis and, you know, how plants change color and all that. But right. uh, you can take a positive uh, digitally captured image and just print it on Pictorico. So you have a positive, clear positive and lay it on top of uh, whatever leaf you want. Almost right. uh, the ones that are glossy don't work quite as well as the more matte finished uh, leaves. But if you uh, put it in a contact printer and a positive uh, transparency on top and just leave it out in sunlight for maybe a day. Uh, the sunlight bleaches those areas out that are supposed to be white mm -hmm. and you take it out and you have a leaf with a photographic image on it, you know, right. which uh, could have its own kind of meaning depending on what kind of plant it is, you know, what kind of image goes with the plant, what kind of folklore uh, goes with it or uh, 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 whatever kind of uh, folk tale might go along with it or mythology. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, 
Yeah, it's endless. <laughs> endless fun. Yeah. yeah, I think so. And I think you're right. That's why you're still there doing it for sure. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Did we have any last questions from anybody who wanted to mute and ask anything? We are a little bit past time now, so we should probably wrap up, but open to any kind of last thoughts or questions. And I want to thank you three for coming and joining us. It was really good to have a group of photographers together, too. I think here, um, again, I think photography is so it's on everybody's phone now. But there's such a rich history and range of things you can do and a real, you know, professional practice in this yeah. area too, where everybody's a photographer. So it's good to hear from, from you three for sure. So thank right. you so much for coming. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for Michael. Your, your, your mic's not working. Can you hear me now? Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I was just going to say, John, thank you for the kind words. I really appreciate that. And I really loved your thoughts and we're, we're thinking a lot alike. I, I, I just wanted to say, one of the reasons that I, I really ended up developing this relationship with abandoned structures is I came to see them as a metaphor for repression. Oh, yeah. uh, things that are barely there. You can barely touch them. They, and they're, they're slowly slipping away every day. So I, I really appreciated your thoughts. And I, and I also uh, love seeing the images. And I was thinking about the value of going back to work you did a while ago because you see it so differently. And then – you were radically reinterpreting it in terms of how, how you were uh, printing it, right? And yeah. in a way that you may not have at that time. And so right. the images would not have looked the same. And, and that's always really a fascinating thing to see. So that was really amazing right. to see and yeah. hear you talk about. Here's a question, you know, uh, as a photographer uh, at night, ever get the feeling that uh, time is altered by light? Does time move quicker in light? than it does in shadows. Well, isn't there uh, something about the, the like literal structure of light particles that places it in a, like a kind of literal timelessness, I think. Right. I, I remember reading and thinking about that at one point and that there is something very unique about light in its relationship to time, light yeah. speed. The, it is, it's right. a, a totally different. I mean, I think light's such a key thing for all art practice for most art practices too light is such a huge element in it but it has an otherworldly relationship yeah. i think to us on yeah. earth here that is yeah you know, I, photographers I have one, that to use all the time you know really yeah i had one physics class in my life so i'm deeply underqualified to answer that question john <laughs> but uh but i will say this that it, there if i'm standing in the dark and photographing something it does feel like time has slowed right in a way that doesn't occur in the light you know and so my experience of the process is different at night too it's more contemplative it's more meditative it's more present in a way that it's not in the day so maybe you know in from but i but i can't i technically don't know right well, so another <laughs> weird nerdy science thing is I also something about brainwaves recently in yeah. the, the fact that you do sense others brainwaves. So I've always been like, I'm an artist who would be up till three in the morning and totally the same thing, like dro driving around Omaha at three in the morning when it's like the city that's busy is, but I, I know I could feel that those brainwaves aren't like clinging to mine. So there's a lot, I think a lot there too, in terms of darkness and the space and the room that and freedom to experience fully from your own self, you know? Well, and of course, it does seem like the universe, uh, you know, is dark, you know, infinity, you know, the darkness goes on without any kind of um, uh, energy. Uh, well, of course, <laughs> no energy, but, but uh, if there's uh, some light, uh, it seems like some element of time comes into play, you know, like time uh, or light burns out, you know, there's some time limit. You know, suns, uh, you know, the, the sun will burn out, some light bulbs burn out, you know, but the darkness doesn't have any, anything holding it in, no, no limits as far as I know. But, uh, you know, and that maybe plays into that uh, uh, kind of feeling, you know, that uh, something's altered with the energy of light uh, in, a, in a, the infinity of darkness that uh, seems to be connected to the universe and its expanse. Yeah. 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 It's a great thought. Yeah. <laughs> well, I suppose we should wrap it up. We're probably one of our longer chats, but it's good. It's good to have. And I love it at the end, especially when the artists have 
that kind of dialogue. So thanks for hanging on with us and sharing those thoughts. It was really good to have you. Great to have you in the show and hopefully we'll see you again in the next biennial. All right. All right. So thanks thank everybody you. for coming. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. All right. Thanks, ladies. That was Thanks great. Yes. Oh, I yeah, know. This has been so good. I think it, I've just had such a blast. And never, never have we heard from like, you know, you read the the text that they submit and you see their images and it's so different when you get to sit down and have conversations with people. I think this is so yeah. fun. Yeah, it was so, really fun. Excuse me. I want to go dig in my old notes and think, you know, back in way back in the beginning of time and art in the school, <laughs> like we used to take John's photography out to the classroom so what i'd like to know yeah. sometimes just off the cuff jody what yeah, yeah. We, works of his we probably have in the collection that we i think do i might have some we do uh, that that would make sense because i know we've got some older pieces we just recently got some from signy but i know yeah. we had at least one or two already okay. in the collections yeah that's um, just and i'm trying my to brain here to yeah, remember that i don't I, doubt yeah and that's a good one to do too. I do think that kids so dig, like I did cyan, not cyanotypes, you call them like um, solar prints. I well, like when I did arts and crafts with kids in the parks, because okay. it's basically a cyanotype. You can do it with construction paper too. Yeah. Like if you have a see-through negative, you can put it on construction paper, sit it outside and construction paper fades so fast. We would yeah, show, stuff. I, I, yeah. there's so much cool stuff. And that was my husband, you know, he was asking early on, my husband studied photography with him and Jamie got okay. so into dark room and yeah. the kind of experimentation you can do with materials oh, sure. and chemical processes and stuff. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. really neat. I don't, and I don't yeah. think people especially realize that you can do so much of that with photography. Well, I don't think nowadays because we're all, everybody's right. walking around with an iPhone. Digital. But, you yep. know, I was old enough to kind of, know about a dark room in a high school right. class you know back before there was any digital images i can actually remember that <laughs> yeah. it's just delightful to kind of he just is very he's very awesome charismatic and i know his name yeah. has come up in art in the schools and in he's South so Dakota. great i think he's been maybe a judge for things or something and he really i think he's been at usd like 40 years i was asking the department chair like what well, is he gonna retire because everyone else is retired Oh. But he just enjoys it so much. And yeah, you can tell you know, what he said is, yeah, so true. It's so John yeah. through and through. Thank you. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. Was fun. That. This has been great. You know, I have yeah. been watching them. Um, I don't know. To me, they don't seem as live when I watch them because I want to be able to talk to you all. So. Right. right. Yeah. It's fun to have <laughs> the ability to converse. But at least we do have the yeah. replay. So oh, yeah. thank you. You've all done so much. Yeah. I will let you go. Enjoy yeah. your night. Thanks. All right. Take care. Thank you. See ya. Bye. Bye.